All right, hopefully everyone had a good forage uh, and now you're on to greener pastures here. Actually, it's, it's a tall order for me to, to follow Steve, who literally wrote the book on silvopasture. So ho hopefully everyone um, is ready to learn more, though. Hopefully I've got more to offer. Um, it's, it's great to be here at Practical Farmers of Iowa. This is a conference that I've wanted to come to for some years. And um, this is a side note, but my, my family's actually from Iowa. My, my dad is from Cedar Rapids. And my mom is from Northeast Iowa, near Garnavillo, uh, on a farm there. So good to be back in Iowa, I guess. Uh, I, like I said in the introduction, I'm based in Madison, Wisconsin now, but my family's from the Kickapoo Valley. That's where I try to get out of the city as often as I can and, and have had research projects there recently on Silmo Pasture, which has been my excuse to get out of town and, and um, get out in the woods and the, and the pastures and, and that sort of thing. So I'll be talking about that some as, as well as... Uh, research that I've been working on with farms in Illinois and Indiana as well. And uh, it's great to see all the interest in silvopasture coming from a lot of different quarters and to see all of you here interested. And, and, and I do also want to mention this morning, I, I had a great opportunity with uh, my colleague Diane, who you'll hear from next, to visit Bruce Carney's farm. Uh, some of you may know Bruce from uh, being a neighbor and a practical farmer, but uh, we're looking at the potential, hopefully, of having a, a field day of some sort this year in cooperation with PFI at Kearney Farms. And so that's why we were out there. Bruce is, and his family have done a lot in plant, both planting trees, which we'll be talking about, and converting woodlands to silvopasture, which we'll be talking about. So we can only cover so much in a short course. And of course, there's no substitute for seeing what, how it works or can work uh, on, a, on a working farm. So hopefully this is just a primer, and if you, if you want to dig deeper, you can join us. Stay tuned. PFI puts out the, the field day calendar in March, or soon thereafter, I believe, so you can stay tuned there. Um, so the other thing I should warn you before I get started is that I've done exactly what they tell presenters not to do through some of this presentation, which is I've put a lot of information up on the slides, probably more than I'm going to have opportunity to explain. So if there's something you want clarified, because I'm going too fast, please do ask. But also know that PFI is going to make the slides available following uh, online. So you can see the, the slides there. If there's some detail you didn't catch or, or whatever, and don't feel like you have to write everything down. But I do want to emphasize, like Steve said at the beginning of his presentation, it's nice if we can have a back and forth too. So don't hesitate on, on questions or comments. And I'll try to keep us moving, though, if, if we need to, because I wanted to introduce you to a lot of ideas and principles. Like Steve said, silvopasture is not a prescription. Do ABC, get XYZ. It's much more about what are the processes and principles that you can customize for your own context and goals on your farm. So giving you food for thought here, but not telling you this is the way it should or could work on your farm. So the two uh, broad approaches to silver pasture establishment, Steve mentioned this, that I'm going to cover are putting your trees into your pastures and putting your pasture into the trees. So we're going to start with the former and then we'll get to the latter. And the, again, just to, I'm gonna, actually I actually want to start by zooming out a little bit like Steve did too. This is the Spanish Dehesa, again, uh, this is a model of an agricultural ecosystem where livestock and pasture and trees are integrated together, which is different than how a lot of modern agriculture happens where the crops and what we feed the animals is separate from where the animals are, which this, to me, has a higher order of efficiency. This is the way a lot of nature organizes itself. And if we can figure out how to make a living managing ecosystems like this, then I think that's going to be better for making our farms more livable places to be, um, as well as having higher quality farm products and having a higher quality environment. So to me, this is what we could be moving towards in the Midwest. A question? Dehesa, it's D-E-H-E-S-A. That's the Spanish version and Montado 
is uh, the Portuguese version. And uh, like Steve said, they, we, I don't think any of us are going to talk much about branding here, but they, for their products, uh, especially the, the uh, pork products that come out of these systems, they have uh, protected designations of origin and type. And so you can't market ham that has an acorn or a tree next to it. It's illegal unless it's grown in these certified systems and they command a handsome premium. It can be over $1,000 for one leg of ham that is a jamón ibérico. So. Some food for thought. So before we get into the, the uh, nuts and bolts of silvopasture, the thing I want to emphasize is it's good to go into this with a plan. And um, there are a lot of different frameworks for planning. One that I really like is called Whole, Whole Farm Planning. There's a book from NOFA, which is the, the Northeast Organic Farming Association, called Whole Farm Planning. And it's really about this circular process of evaluating and assessing what do you have, articulating your goals, monitoring progress towards those goals, um, designing and implementing and reevaluating. So it's a process, the plan is, is, a, is a process that iterates and you adapt as you go. And with silvopasture, I think the first step in that process is saying, is silvopasture a fit for my farm? And I think the place to usually to start is what are my goals? What are my goals for profitable enterprises, for the people that are involved, and for the planet or for the place where I am. How will silvo pastures fit with my existing systems? What, do I, what am I starting with? What are my systems for feeding animals, watering them, fencing, providing shade and shelter? Adapting silvo pasture to what you already have is often going to be the most effective rather than trying to recreate the wheel. And then thinking about how the pieces work together, and Steve talked about this too. It's not uh, three separate systems, trees, forage, and livestock. It's how do we fit them all together. And then what are my constraints? So what am, I, what am I gonna run into as I get into this? Do I have the time? Do I have the budget? Do I have the knowledge? What's the plan? 23 simple steps to developing an agroforestry plan. <laughs> this is partly in jest, but this is actually a fantastic resource from the Center for Agroforestry in Missouri. Uh, they have a website with lots of resources on it uh, about all kinds of agroforestry, but including silvopasture. And you know, you can take a look at this, and you may not need to go through all 23 steps. But what's helpful here is, I think, if as we're getting into something that's new, is what we don't want is to be blindsided by something that we hadn't thought about. So a lot of this is making sure, oh, did I think about how limbs might fall off of trees onto my fences. Did I plan for that? So we don't want any surprises. So again, lots of different planning frameworks. I don't think it really matters which one you use. I think a good plan has a purpose. It's about a specific place. The plan is actually written down. It's not just some ideas. And it's put into action. It doesn't just sit on the shelf. And then monitoring and adapting that plan as you go. So that I wanted to give you my bit on planning because I think that more than any particular thing you might do is what leads to success as you're implementing <coughs> silvo pasture or any kind of new system. So into tree planting now and these are going to be questions that you need to find an answer for as you develop a plan and I'm going to give you some ideas about how other people do it but it's going to be what fits for your farm. First question if I'm going to plant trees, where to plant the trees? So thinking about layout and design one principle in silvopasture is to have uniform or light shade. You don't want all your shade under one tree, and that's also where your waterer is, because then that's where the cattle will spend all their time, and they won't be eating in the rest of the paddock or other livestock uh, and spreading nutrients around. Another thing to think about is where do you need shade? Planting trees along the western edge of a paddock can give you that uh, afternoon shade when you need it when the temperatures are highest. Uh, water, I mentioned, you want them to have access to water but not to clump around it. One way that can work well sometimes is to have shade on one end of a paddock and water on the other, and then the animals are using the pasture in between those. Thinking about machinery access, how, as, as you're planting trees, you don't want to plant a tree where it's going to be in the way later. Uh, the same with fencing. How many trees to plant can vary a lot depending on what your goals, what type of trees, etc. 
And then, as Steve said, plan that some of your trees are going to die, but be thinking about what is going to be their size when they're mature. Um, this would probably be a, as good a time as any. I don't remember if I have a slide about this. Savannah Institute, uh, we released a book last year, Planting Tree Crops, that goes into a lot of details about planting trees. And you can buy one of these from us, or we have this available for free as a PDF on savannahinstitute.org. So you're welcome to, to get it there, too. If you don't want to plan, you can just do it like Bob Ross, the painter, who says, maybe in our world there lives a happy little tree here and here and here. <laughs> if you don't know Bob Ross, forgive this joke. But <laughs> uh, so what kind of trees to plant? What species and age of trees? So there are benefits to having diversity, a lot of different types of trees. They can do different things. You can harvest them in different sequences over years or in different seasons within years. And if you planted all ash trees, for example, as the emerald ash borer decimates ash, you wouldn't be in good shape. So it's an insurance policy as different pests or problems show up to have a diversity of trees. A challenge of planting around diversity is, for example, two different trees might grow at different speeds. And so if you don't plan for that, your fast growing tree might overtop and shade out your slower growing tree. So uh, planning for those, uh, com for complementary functions rather than uh, competition sometimes is important. In terms of which species and age of trees to plant, you want to know your site. What's the soil type? What's the pH of the soil? What's the hydrology like? And choose a tree that's adapted uh, for those conditions. In silvo pasture, oftentimes it's nice to have a shade that's not too dense. Maple, for example, has a very dense shade, so not a lot of light gets through. Whereas other trees, such as walnut, have a more filtered light. That, that gets through, so that's something to think about. What do you want out of those trees? Is it just shade, or do you want nuts? Do you want timber, do you want syrup? Do you want uh, fodder trees? So th thinking about that, and then what are the other desired characteristics as you're selecting species? Do you want fast growing? Do you want something that's not gonna sh shed a lot of limbs? What's deep rooted? What has value as forage if it's fodder? Here's a list, um, this came from Wisconsin, but a lot of these are applicable to Iowa. It's by no means exclusive, but these are things that we've seen in some context can work well in pasture settings. Um, and notice at the bottom there's, you know, one bullet for orchard crops. And so that includes a lot of different things potentially. Uh, and you can think about uh, how do these different species work together potentially. Can I have a large canopy tree that's growing next to a hedgerow of shrubs, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, some principles with selecting, are you gonna plant older, more mature trees or younger seedlings? Older trees cost more and they're more work to plant, that, um, but there's less maintenance because they're more mature already and you can get the benefits that you're looking for sooner. The benefits with younger trees are that they're more affordable and it's easier to plant them with the machine. You can plant a lot of them in a short amount of time, but there's more maintenance to keep them alive and lower survival rates. So there's, those are trade-offs you can think about. If you haven't seen a, a mechanical tree planter before, this is something a lot of times county conservation offices or forestry offices, I know Bruce told me he's worked with his local conservation office where they essentially let you use or rent for very cheaply a tree planter here and, and you can plant thousands of trees in a day that way. Um, that's, that's the easy part, is planting them. Uh, preparing the site for tree planting, this is an, an important part, um, and depending on how you do it, it can be uh, very helpful. It's, it's a, the principle of a stitch in time saves nine. A stitch in time saves nine. So planting trees into sod, which is what a lot of pasture is, can be a very difficult environment for a tree to thrive. There's a lot of competitive pressure from those grasses and the other uh, plants in the pasture. And so especially if you're planting into an actively used pasture, uh, preparing that sod so that your seedling trees have got the best chance of survival um, can be really, really helpful. Save a lot of time on weeding later on and you can get the benefits of those trees sooner. So there's a lot of different ways to do it, but it's again, something that you need to have in your plan is how am I gonna prep the site? Whether that's grazing very intensively in those areas where you're gonna to plant to knock back that competition, tillage or cultivation, repeated mowing, stale seed beds, um, mulching ahead of time, using row, row covers that's pl plastic or something like that can work on some scales, 
or herbicides if that's uh, something that you use. So a lot of different ways to do it. Depends on the context, what's going to work best for you. And then uh, prepping the site is also making sure that that soil is well suited for the trees. That's come up a couple times that soils that have had trees in them previously sometimes are, are better, are going to work for trees better sooner. But you can stimulate that sometimes by adding a mycorrhizal inoculant um, pH or something for some tree species you do want to pay close attention to. Chestnut, for example, likes a lower pH. So if you have a, a pasture that's been limed or is naturally a, a basic uh, pH, for example, you, you just want to be attentive to that. And, and drainage. Uh, some trees have different needs in terms of how much, uh, how much water they can tolerate or dryness they can tolerate. Uh, if, if you have a local forestry office, this can be a good time to go in and say, what trees are, are well suited for where I'm at, or a conservation office, and they can help you pull up soil maps and that sort of thing and, and look at what performs well in your particular area. So I, I recommend uh, talking with somebody with experience if it's not something you've done previously. Uh, managing competing vegetation once the trees are planted. Um, I've done this, planted trees and then not given them enough attention and the weeds over top them and the trees disappear. It's really easy to do. Like I say, planting the trees is the easy part. So having a plan for, are you gonna put down weed mats? Are you gonna use herbicide? Both of these I give as examples that can work, but herbicide, this is a black walnut seedling damaged by herbicide. And these weed mats can cause some problems too, especially if livestock like to dig at them and they can actually pull them over the trees or if you hit them with a mower. So it's not a one size fits all thing, but um, having some plan for how to deal with those weeds. And then, those we, they're not too expensive, but if you're doing a lot of tree planting, then they can uh, add up. What's the cheapest way to do it actually is to get uh, landscape fabric from a wholesale garden supply or landscape supply company. Um, so protecting young trees from livestock and wildlife pests, I'm gonna dig in on this one a little bit because all that other stuff on tree planting, you can get that information from other sources, but if you actually wanna integrate uh, trees into actively used pastures. If you can't just let your trees mature for 10 years before you bring your livestock in, then you need to do a good job of protecting those trees from the livestock. Uh, planting and establishment, uh, there's a lot of different ways to do it. You can shear total utter neglect is the infamous method of most trees die. Or there's the old saying, dig a $50 hole for a $5 tree. I think that's probably not a great idea either, so it's probably somewhere in the middle is what's gonna work for you. Um, competing vegetation beforehand, and then are you gonna hand plant, or are you gonna machine plant, or some combination thereof. Bruce was describing this morning, he, he used a tree spade where he had planted trees very densely in one area of his farm, and then as they matured, he was able to rent a tree spade and then move those trees out into his pastures when they were already at a fairly high, high level of maturity. So thinking about what's gonna work for your farm. And then maintenance, a lot of ways to do it, but the principle here is to keep your costs low without stunting the trees too much. You do want them to grow. Um, so you can put a lot of time and energy into mulching everything and pulling every weed, but that's probably not feasible. But again, if you don't do anything, you're probably not gonna have any trees. So I'm gonna describe a study um, that I worked on with these four farmers and this is my colleague Christy at Savannah Institute and um, with support from USDA SARE, we evaluated different methods of protecting seedling trees in actively used pastures with different livestock. So I'm gonna give you a taste of some of the things that we found about how to best protect young trees from livestock and wildlife pests. This is where those four farms are and on the different farms they had cattle, hogs, sheep, sheep, hogs, sheep, turkeys, so different variety, of different types of livestock. And it's a little bit hard to see in this photo, but we, some of the different methods we tested were um, having a control with either no protection or just a short tube. Uh, this, you can't really see, but that's a, you'll see again, a wire cage that goes around the tree. These are uh, what are commonly called tree tubes. They're polyethylene tubes that go up four or five feet. And then uh, fencing off the trees with a, a woven wire or a single strand electric. So we um, measured tree survival and growth with those different methods, how much weed pressure there was with the different methods and what were the uh, 
time and expenses associated. So the farmers um, took data on their, their trees and their pastures. And here's, uh, you can see uh, browsing damage. This is what this looks like a lot of times where, like Steve said, they take off that apical bud and then you get a lot of lateral sprouts. Not a great way for a tree to get started. And so we rated before a grazing event and after a grazing event. Uh, green is how much browsing damage was there none and red is heavy, so heavy browsing damage. So in this case with uh, sheep and poultry, roughly half of their trees had heavy damage in the control with no protection. Oops, um, oops sorry, this is advancing too far. Uh, with cattle, this is uh, on another farm, they, using tree tubes, before the grazing event, most of the trees had no damage. Afterwards, all of the trees had either heavy or some damage. So these, in this case, tubes were a bad idea because they attracted the cattle to do more damage to the trees. This is what research is good for us, telling you what not to do. Was there a question there? Yeah. Uh, we planted over 200 trees like that in the last year. In some places, you put the, what do you know, the top guys put what you guys put, or half over the top. <laughs> The cattle or the deer? Yeah, so deer, deer are a major issue, um, and that's why we frame this as livestock and wildlife damage. Um, well, just one recommendation I give you is uh, if you haven't planted trees on your farm before or haven't done it much, probably there's a neighbor around you somewhere that has, and they'll be able to tell you if, if deer have been a problem or if it's gophers or what it is and what they've done that's successful. So oftentimes that's going to be one of your best sources of information. Um, and because if it's heavy deer, you got to deal with them somehow, or again, you won't have trees. Uh, the cages here, you can see a little bit better uh, view. This is what's the brand we, we tested is called Arbor Shield, and they have little barbs on them. You can get them uh, from Home Depot, and they're they're pretty expensive. You'll see some data on their cost and time, but they're they're pretty bulletproof. They have three pieces of rebar that are used to stake them down. So. If, and because they have the barbs, the cattle don't want to rub on them anyway. You can see uh, with, with cattle here, with the cages, there was no browse damage. With tubes, you saw that data. Pretty good success with a single strand electric as well. There was some problems, however, when they had uh, the herd with calves, with the cow-calf herd, because as many of you probably know, calves will oftentimes go under that single strand, and it's usually not a problem because they come back to mom. But if they want to, you know, go right down your line of trees and browse it, a single strand doesn't work as well. Question. Did you ever try putting a single strand with tubes? We didn't in this experiment, but actually Michael Dolan, the farmer here, when we did our debriefing at the end of the experiment, that's what he said he was going to do going forward because that was a good way to keep both the deer off and deal with the cattle. And the tubes actually give the tree even beyond protecting it. It's a mini greenhouse, so you get better vertical growth more quickly with the tube. A question? It's called Arbor Shield, and I think I have a slide that shows p people made them themselves too using livestock panel or something like that. And it's a little cheaper, but it takes more time. Here you go, Arbor Shield brand, fifteen to twenty dollars each. Uh, the one farm made their own, and it cost them about ten dollars in material. They said, "Don't cut your own rebar; just buy it cut at the length that you want." And they spent a lot of time on that. <laughs> um, i see if I can summarize this for you here. So this is looking at uh, weed control. So that, that one of the things that livestock can do to help the trees, if they're well protected, is knock down that competing vegetation, the weeds around the trees. And, um, and with the tree tube, you can see the height right at the tree, one foot away or three foot away, the weed height was lower after the cattle went through. With the cages right at the tree, you know, it's about 16 inches in diameter. So the cattle can't get in to eat those weeds that are right next to the tree. So that's one of the, one of the drawbacks there with the cages. There you can see a photo of how that plays out. So that can be a problem. And another problem with these cages sometimes is that the trees will rub up against them. 
if they're not strong enough, and that can cause girdling damage. And the tubes can cause problems too. There you can see a little mouse in there. Um, and this is a nest after the, tree's the tube's taken off and the mouse has girdled that tree too. So uh, having uh, a way to deal with, so in some places it's not a problem at all, but if there are a heavy vole population, that can do damage to trees as well. So it's, it's a war zone out there. You know, a lot of people think if you're going to go plant trees, you're, you know, you love nature and everything, but before too long, you, you know, you're finding ways to, to kill the wildlife <laughs> if you can. <laughs> Um, here, this is a pretty quick take home. Swine killed all trees without protection. Uh, w with the cages, they, this is before and after, the height of the trees was the same. But the tubes, again, were an attractant for the hogs. They wanted to play with them and knock them down. A question? Are mice and voles only uh, a problem when you have a small confined phase? No, they, the mice and voles, are they only a problem with a small confined phase? No, it, and sometimes if you have nothing at all, they're still a problem. But it can be worse, for example, if you use cut grass as a mulch. They love to use that to nest in. Um, so cutting your grass short before winter time sometimes discourages that because then you get more aerial predators. Owls and hawks will help keep down the mice. Um, so and again, it's no one size fits all. But w one thing I don't know if I have in here, but it's a good idea with tree planting and a lot of things is Make your mistakes small. So you know, don't get all excited and decide you're going to go out and plant 40 acres with 40,000 trees uh, if you haven't done that before. Try it on half an acre. Plant a few hundred trees, and you'll learn what works and what doesn't work. Um, plant small, but do it big enough that you can make the mistakes that you would make if you were doing 40 acres is my advice. Oops. Um, with, she with sheep and with deer, uh, I'm going to skip this. Tubes are better than nothing in some cases, though. That's a take home there. Um, with the tubes, spend the extra dollar to get the five-foot tubes, four-foot tubes. Don't, don't do as well. Um, you can see uh, the browse damage was a lot higher. 60% of the four-foot compared to 10% of the five-foot tubes had that browse damage. And the cost is not that much different. Here you can see install time for those uh, wire cages, six and a half minutes versus a minute per tree tube. So. That's an investment of time as well. Uh, these are some other systems fencing out that row of trees. The, in this case, uh, Dutch white clover was planted along with the trees. So that was a way to manage the weeds or the competing vegetation was to plant their own weeds, essentially. And then um, having the, the trees just on the outside of this fence, here's a, a young oak seedling. That oftentimes worked well, too. And we saw that on, on Bruce's farm where if, especially if you have an electric fence system already, sometimes it's just an extra little jig in your, in your fencing system is where you can put that tree, making a little triangle. And I don't think I have a good photo of it, but uh, oftentimes with simple, creative use of your electric fence, you can get most, here, here's an example of, the, you can't see the trees were just planted here. They haven't leafed out yet. And this pasture's a little overgrazed, but this was the idea is that with this single strand, the cattle can reach under to eat the grass, but they can't get above if it's far enough away to eat off the top of the tree. So it's a little tricky to get that exactly right, but it can work. The other op option is just to wrestle your livestock <laughs> out of your trees. Um, a word on sheep is that they really love to defoliate a lot of, of different types of trees and shrubs. So, even with the cages, they'll get what's on the outside of the cages. With no protection, they'll just camp out and eat it. And in some cases, that doesn't actually kill the tree. It just knocks it back. So if, especially if you're rotating really quickly, that might not be the end of the world. But this was a row of currants, and the, and the sheep just went right down that row, and, and they wanted to eat the currant leaves, for example. So, so the, um, that's the, the section on planting trees. Any questions or comments on that before we move on? Yes? I would just throw out some good life ideas like with the tree tubes, and then I put the, like two cups of pea gravel, and I started planting them to the two bottoms, and that keeps the voles and mice from breeding up. I think that's where they're coming from, and then it some things. So a little bit of rock goes a long way to stop them later. Yeah, I've done, I've done that too, and if you're planting a lot of trees, it gets to be a little bit fussy, but if you've got a lot of voles, you have to do something about it. Question is, what works really good on deer? Um, <clears throat> it, 
A little bit of everything. I mean, you can talk to 10 people who've had success keeping deer off their trees, and they might have done 10 different things. I think the 3D fencing that Steve showed it can be a really good solution, and it's not that much extra to add if you're already doing livestock. It's just adding another a single strand or double strand. The idea is just that you, instead of a single, it's called 3D fence because instead of one fence line, you've essentially got two fence lines right next to each other, and they're at, at different heights. And that just throws off the deer so they can't jump over them. Um, the other thing about deer is that they're creatures of habit. And so if get your deer protection in right away when you plant the trees. Because if they never learn to come there, then that's going to save you a lot of, uh, of time and headache down the road. Um, and the other thing that can, that can work good for deer is ha having a dog or I think having livestock out there too can help, but it, especially if you're on a long rotation, you're not always going to have livestock there. So it really depends on the context. Sometimes the tubes, it, that's enough. You can, you can get away with just the tree tubes. There's a, there are also um, bittering agents, things that make it taste unpalatable, um, and those people have had mixed success with. Even just a bucket, uh, a five-gallon bucket with rotten eggs mixed into water, and then you sp spray that on your trees, but then you got to redo that every time it rains or every week, so that's not that practical either. So th there's a lot of different ways to do it. Uh, again, that's a good one to talk to your neighbors who have planted trees um, and see what's worked well in, in that area. Other thoughts, questions on, on that? Yeah, I, I don't mean to promote that that solves everything, um, but in combination with other methods of, of managing competing vegetation, it might at least help give you a head start. In that, in that first year especially, it takes a little time for those trees to leaf out, and especially like oak seedlings are putting more energy into developing their root systems instead of going up, so even buying yourself a little bit of time. And if you're in worn out soils too, if you're planting into a crop field rather than a, than a pasture, or even a beat up pasture, clover can help sort of stimulate the soil biology as well. Okay, um, and now for something completely different. Now we are going into the woods. And um, so just a couple of slides here. This is actually how I got interested in silvopasture. I, like Steve, came from a forest ecology background. I'd been working on an annual organic vegetable uh, farm for a number of years. It felt like a lifetime, and that's why I decided I needed to go to grad school. <laughs> Many of you have probably worked in organic vegetables, and it's a lot of hard work. So we thought, yeah, maybe trees are less work. Um, but anyway, so it, as I was talking to farmers about uh, how are trees a part of your farm, um, these are some of the things that I heard. So you may have seen this kind of, you may have this kind of thing on your farm. A lot of woods in the Midwest look like this, where there's these big old trees with these, what used to be horizontal spreading branches. You can see this fellow's hand is where there used to be a low branch. And that's a sign that this tree used to be open grown. Um, it had space to spread its branches without other trees around it. And then coming up around it, uh, there are all these little, uh, small diameter, much younger trees, um, oftentimes maple or something shade tolerant, and they're shading out these lower branches and any oak seedlings are not going to have a chance because they're being shaded out by the maple. So um, this got, got me thinking about, well, well how, what are we going to do to get more, more uh, appropriate conditions for oak to regenerate? And then talking about how farmers are already using cattle, in the woods, not calling it silver pasture, but say we rotate them around, it gives the pastures a break, especially the woods, and saying there's forage out there, our woods isn't real thick, it's brushy, there's grasses and stuff growing up under the trees. So they got me thinking that maybe there's something to pasturing in the woods, because the, for a good reason, for decades, professional foresters and resource professionals have said, don't put your livestock in the woods. And the good reason is, without managed grazing, without rotating the cattle uh, or other livestock, a lot of woods have been wrecked. Timber quality, dives, soil erosion, the, the, you know, the soils 
don't have sod, they're much more sensitive to that. A lot of compacted soils, wildlife habitat destroyed. Um, so a lot of the things that we look for from our woods, timber, water quality, soil quality, wildlife, destroyed by livestock. So why, why would you do that? Um, but maybe there's a better way. And so uh, we think with silvopasture and rotational grazing, maybe it's not the same as just putting your cattle or your cows or any livestock out in the woods. And then uh, started learning about how farmers are managing the trees that they do have. And maybe this is something you have on your farms too, elm that come up, box elder, uh, red cedar, and oftentimes these are seen as nuisance trees, but also uh, I don't cut all the red cedar, the birds like it and the cattle rub up against it. So thinking about ways to use the trees that you do have too, and, and box elder being a sort of supplemental or emergency forage. Maybe you've got a patch, you don't cut them down all at once, but cut down one every day or two and let the cattle strip the leaves off before bucking it up uh, for firewood or something like that. But we did a study looking at grazed woodland compared to ungrazed woodland. So not silvopasture, but just what's going on most commonly on farms, because there is a lot of pasture that is woods, as Steve said. So in this study, I'll run you through some of these slides quick, but it's important. This was, we just did this in the last few years. So grazed woodlands just, um, even if it's not a lot of animals, if they're not being rotated and you're not managing the, the canopy and the forage, um, we saw some effects that were not very good for the woods, so to speak. So in this study, we had our first five farms. These were ungrazed woods. And then we had another 10 that were grazed. And as the numbers go up, the grazing intensity goes up in terms of uh, the stocking density of cattle. So there was less litter depth in the grazed woodlands. As you might expect, the cattle were tromping the litter and it decomposed more faster. And then bare soil, there was more bare soil in the grazed woodlands. And like Steve said, that's an indicator of poor forest quality. Having bare soil leaves you vulnerable to erosion. It means you don't have um, a lot of beneficial vegetation growing there. Shrub cover was higher in the grazed woodlands. And that was a contrary to something we learned from the interviews in the study. Was a lot of farmers said, I like to put my cattle in the woods because it helps keep the brush down. Well. Um, in fact, we saw that especially the dairy farms, the brush was higher. The beef did a better job of actually keeping down the brush, but um, shrub cover tended to be higher. And, it, and not all shrubs are equal either. A lot of times we just say the brush, we wanna get rid of the brush. But in fact, we have uh, quite a few native shrubs that are very beneficial for wildlife and, um, and they're an important part of forest and savanna ecosystems. But then I'm sure you're all familiar with the invasive shrubs that we have, multiflora rose, honeysuckle, Japanese barberry, buckthorn. Uh, if you don't have these on your farm, learn what they are. And as soon as you start seeing them, get them out of there because they spread. And, and you can see, so these are the invasive shrubs here. There was a lot more of them in the grazed woodlands. So it, maybe it can be a way to manage that if you already have it, but if you don't have those things, be aware that grazing might help open up space for those things to come in. It, uh, just if you're not familiar with these shrubs, uh, it's an important part of managing woodlands to recognize multiflora rose, honeysuckle. This is uh, European buckthorn. Bruce and I were talking about this today. You can identify it, it kind of looks like an apple tree, but the, the uh, leaves are almost opposite. That's the best way to identify it. And, um, Sometimes it, when it, it looks, kind of grows multi-stemmed and it looks like, a, 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 like it can look like black cherry, the bark kind of flakes like that. Anyway, get, get to know that. And then Japanese barberry, I'm not sure how much there is of that in Iowa, but it started to spread more in Wisconsin too. It's a, an ornamental used in landscaping, but it can start to take over understories as well. Um, so grazing woodlands without managing, intensive management is not silvopasture. That's the take home here. And then uh, soil compaction. This was uh, soil bulk density as a measure of compaction. When your bulk density is higher, then you have more compaction. So in the three grazed woodlots that we measured, bulk density was higher. Not off the charts, you know, the levels of, of bulk density in, a, in a, a cultivated field can be much higher than this, but still a, a measurable difference. So what's the alternative? Silvopasture, bringing pasture into the trees. Can we intensify management? 
So what I suggest, before you do anything, site assessment, site assessment, site assessment. And this would be a good place for me to, to plug Steve's book as well. The, the chapter in here on bringing pasture into the woodlands um, goes through a detailed process of site assessment. And that, that's really important because not all sites are equal. And understanding what is already there is going to make you much more effective in accomplishing your goals. So it's worth taking the time, uh, even though it might seem like, I just want to get going and try something. And, and there's a place for that too. But I really encourage you to assess what condition things are in, uh, both the trees, the understory, the soil, the drainage. Again, there's a good process in the book here. And then think about what's the best use of these woods. If it's high quality timber, like Steve says, probably it's better use to grow high quality timber than to try to convert it to pasture. Uh, that's not an ultimatum, but oftentimes that's the case. And oftentimes the best place to start doing civil pasture is the woods that's in the worst condition. Um, and we can get into why that is. This can also be a good time to bring in a forester or somebody who, if you're not familiar with how to assess condition of a woods, um, Silvo pasture, when you start talking about livestock, a lot of foresters will turn around and walk the other way. So it might take some education or finding a friendly forester, but there really is a lot of knowledge there that, that can be helpful. And then um, a time check. If we're going to start something, do we have the time to develop a plan, to implement it, to follow through, to monitor it and adapt and keep going? If this is you know, one of a million projects and it's going to get put on the back burner, you're probably not going to get out of it what you want to. And then a gut check. The, a lot of this civil pasture implementation, it can take significant time and resources. Um, and is that going to be worth it? Is the juice worth the squeeze, so to speak? And if it's not, then you know maybe wait or try it on a smaller scale or um, think think about it. And is there a better way to do this? And again, should I seek advice from a forester, a grazing planner, or somebody else with the experience or expertise that I need? So this is my recommendation before doing anything. Once you are going to do something, have a plan that, like Steve says, integrates the three parts, the tree and shade management, the forage management, and the livestock management. Um, and those three need to fit together, but you can think about them separately as well. So the, there are a number of different ways to think about managing the canopy. One of the main things, most woods have got too dense of an overstory, so there's not enough light getting through. So how do we decide which trees to cut to get enough light through? There's a technique in forestry called crop tree management, which is essentially about choosing your crop trees, which are your best trees, the ones you want to keep, and then thinning around them, just like you would weed any other crop around it so it has a better growing environment. So this is in contrast to a, what's a very common extractive forestry called high grading, otherwise known as take the best and leave the rest. This rather is about leaving the best so that they can have a good growing environment and add value. Um, and this is uh, what's going to be your best tree depends on the site, and it depends on what your objectives are. So in forestry, oftentimes it's timber, but in silvo pasture, maybe the best tree is the one that's going to give you a particular type of shade, or it's the one that's going to drop a particular type of mast, a fruit or nut that you want. Um, or maybe you, uh, aesthetics or wildlife habitat are important for you. And so an old snag tree that has very little timber value, uh, but maybe it has a cavity where you know it's going to be good for red-headed woodpeckers you're trying to, to um, encourage on your place, that sort of thing um, can be the best tree as well. And then as you go through the trees, um, and this is not in one step, first it's to mark the trees and then to go in with the chainsaw but you're going to thin around it to open up the crown around that tree. And 50%, which is to say, um, in 50% of the area, if you look straight up, there's going to be open sky or uh, overstory above you, is a good target. <coughs> Steve mentioned the tornado. Wind throw vulnerability can be an issue. So if you go too far and then something like that happens, you might end up opening up more canopy than you expected to. Um, but, but do recognize, too, that part of the reason for opening up around your crop trees is they're going to fill out, and they're going to fill in that space, too. And so this is something that doesn't also need to be done all at once. It can be done in stages over the course of years, too. So you're going essentially identifying one crop tree, saying, 
What do I need to do to open up, maybe not all around the tree, but three sides around it and cut those trees? And then what's the next best tree that I want to keep as well and going through your woods that way? So, you know, we could, we could spend a, a whole session going through that. Maybe it's something we can do a little bit at uh, the field day with Bruce, but here's another good place to find a forester or somebody who's done this before. Um, the order of operations that you do things in here can, can make a difference. If you have a lot of large shrubs, you know, big honeysuckle are very common now. You know, they can be 10, 15 feet high and thick. If you start felling trees down into that, trying to get through there with a chainsaw and deal with it, you're going to have a real mess on your hands. And so thinking about, do I need to deal with my shrub layer before I deal with the canopy layer can be helpful. Um, and how am I going to deal with that shrub layer? Is, is there s some of these shrubs that I want to keep? Maybe it's wild hazelnut, and that's really important for wildlife, and you don't see a lot of it around. Or is it mostly buckthorn, and I want to hire a fecon mower, which is a, a skid sear attachment that can mulch and mow shrubs down. Mark your trees ahead of time. You don't want to waste your chainsaw time out in the woods. And uh, winter tree ID is certainly very possible to learn that if you don't know it. A lot of foresters do their tree marking in the winter, but it, it takes some time investment if you don't know how to do it to identify a tree in the winter time. And if you need to, to go out there in the summertime when it's easier to identify the trees. And then have a plan for dealing with the slash. So when you do this, there's gonna be a lot of tree tops, the brush that you cut, um, and, and just a lot of material. And so if you don't have a machinery, do you have the time? Do you have a, a gaggle of teenagers that you can put to work out there? Because if you don't have a plan for that, that can, that can be a real mess too. And thinking about what is your access to equipment, contractors, advisors, and the timing of all that. So these are things that uh, can fit into your plan. And then do you have a way to use those secondary products as well? Steve touched on that. That can be part of your plan as well. So again, no single way to do this, but elements of a plan. Yes. Yeah, well, it depends, okay. right? You know, a brush pile can be a, a nuisance or it can be a, another place for wildlife habitat. And so some people like to have brush piles. Or, you know, you can burn some of them, leave some of them. You can chip it if you really need the mulch. Um, but you just got to have a plan because if you don't, then it's going to be a frustration to say, why, why didn't I think about how to deal with this? Yeah. What do you mean by protect that? Uh, do you need to protect them from the tenants, or if you manage it yeah. with a short-term grazing, is that the case? Yeah, that's a good question. So the question is about if you have high-value timber trees and then you introduce cattle, are they going to damage that tree? Um, the short answer is maybe. So there is a lot of history of high-quality timber being damaged by overgrazing. I think the question is still unanswered whether with rational, well-planned, and adaptive grazing can we minimize or eliminate the damages to those trees. I've seen in some of my research plots mature oak trees that once we introduced cattle died back. But then th there were also mature oak trees that died back in our control plots where we did everything the same but we didn't introduce cattle. So it, we weren't able to determine was it because we introduced cattle um, but, but there is a sort of logic to tree physiology where a younger tree has a less extensive root system and those, that root system is going to adapt to the soil conditions that it is. So a younger tree, the soil conditions are going to change when you introduce livestock, even if it's carefully managed. Soil is going to become somewhat more compacted. The, the bacterial to fungal ratio is going to change the way water and air has space for those roots in the soil is going to change. A large mature tree has a large mature root system and there's a, there's a lot of water volume that's needed to maintain 
the, the capillary action, which is supporting a lot of foliage in a full canopy. So there's reason to think, especially in the site where we saw a few big oak trees die back, it was the top of a limey ridge. So it was pretty thin soils already. And, and so those roots um, potentially were more impacted by having the livestock up there. Um, and it, but it's hard to determine with trees too because a drought in 2012 might not really show up until a few years later when you see the impacts on the trees. So the, the short answer is I would use caution and don't overdo it at the beginning. Um, and again, a forester can be helpful here. Sometimes with walnut, if you wait 10 years, you can double the value of it. And sometimes if it's mature, the time to harvest it is now because if you wait 10 years, uh, it might not be there, cattle or no cow. So um, Diane, do you wanna make a comment on that? Just add a small comment in terms of Keith's story about his oaks and one item on his list that he just mentioned but maybe didn't go into a lot of detail on, the timing of access for equipment, contractors, and so on. The timing of your logging can be really important and uh, you have to have a logger that you really trust to go in when you say it's okay when, because the little bit of compaction that the livestock can cause is nothing compared to the compaction that forestry equipment can cause if it goes in when the soils are wet. And there's also disease transmission issues in the trees. So there's a whole lot of considerations there as well. Yeah. Good point, thank you, Diane. Another question? What do you mean by manage girdled trees? Yeah, so the question is about girdling trees rather than felling them. And um, that's something that I've done with mixed success. So sometimes if, if a girdle is not a complete cut or if it's a very vigorous tree, uh, it'll rejoin uh, where you tried to girdle it so it's not entirely effective. Uh, and um, the, it might work in the short term, but in the long term, if you have a standing dead tree in the wrong place, that can be a safety hazard or something to fall on a fence. Sometimes it's, it's fine too. So girdling is an option. Um, and having standing dead wood is another thing that can add a lot of wildlife habitat. So that's, that can be a solution sometimes, especially too if you're in a tricky situation where felling a tree is gonna potentially damage other trees or, or fencing, then you can just girdle it in place. The other nice thing about girdling sometimes, I've done this with basswood, Box Elder too, it sends out a lot of re-sprouts, right? And that's, that can be valuable forage for the animals. I think we'll talk about this more tomorrow, but girdle, girdling stimulates that. So that can be a way to essentially bring the vitality of that tree down to a place where the livestock can, can get at it. Um, let me see if I'm able to play this video. Th this is the Fecon mower that I mentioned. Uh, there are contractors who do this. So th this is a rotating drum uh, that goes on the front of this skid steer. And the nice thing about it is that it leaves behind not a pile of brush, but wood chips that are kind of mulching on the ground. And the other thing that we had good success with was we broadcast the pasture seeds before it came in. And so then the, the skidder helped to get seed to soil contact for the grasses that we were trying to establish, or the, the forages we were establishing, not just grasses. Um, but this is actually one of the oaks that died back, and so it could have been the compaction caused by this skid or two, even though this is not as bad as some other logging equipment. Something to consider. It's, and they're kind of expensive too. Uh, this contractor was $185 an hour, and you know, they could, depending on what the, how much brush is there or what's there, it really depends how much ground they can cover. But um, in, in certain cases, it worked really well. So, but also not as selective. For example, we had a big area of buckthorn, but there were a few wild plum thickets that we wanted to keep, uh, but they looked too similar and it wasn't possible for him to, uh, to distinguish those. So 
anyway, there are tra trade-offs to everything. Forage establishment, so moving down from the overstory into the understory now. I think it's important to think about what's already there uh, as a first step in, in do we need to plant forages or what do we need to plant? And then if we do want to plant some forages, um, what's the way to do it? Uh, No-till drill may or may not be effective or feasible. Um, broadcasting, one thing I mentioned I'll emphasize is getting that seed to soil contact is really important. Uh, if you're just spreading seed on leaf litter, you're not going to get much out of it. Um, the, using the, the hoof action of your livestock can be a good way to kind of drill your seed in after you broadcast it. Uh, I show this picture because if you have, like right now, if you can um, spread your seed onto a, a light layer of snow, the nice thing is you can see where you're spreading it. And then also, as that snow melts, it, that melt action helps carry the seed down to the soil. Um, and, and then if you get some freeze thaw action, that also helps work that soil, the seed down into the soil. The skid steer, I, I mentioned that. I haven't done this or seen anybody who has, but I think that there is potential for fire to be used at this stage in system establishment too, especially if you have a leaf litter that you need to get through so you can expose some soil and get um, seed there. We tried this with, um, well, I'll get to that later. Um, the other thing for forages, just thinking about planning this out, uh, one of the potentials of silvopasture is that you can even out your forage availability over the season. So in a, sh in a shaded environment in the overstory, you're not going to get as much overall production in most cases, but you're going to get production when you need it most in that summer slump in that June, July, August time. This is data from Missouri, but probably applicable especially as we get more extreme uh, weather here in Iowa and upper Midwest as well. And then oftentimes in Missouri, they saw extensions on the shoulders of the seasons as well in terms of when that forage was productive. So, and then which forages to plant? Um, there are different shade tolerances in terms of how productive different forages will be under a shaded environment. So reed canary grass, uh, many people love to hate, other people love to love. It is, uh, this is under 50% shade it was still getting 70% of its productivity. And then um, for an annual ryegrass, only 40% roughly. Annual ryegrass I think can be a nice one though too because that's something that you can get ground coverage right away instead of having exposed soil uh, in a mix. Orchard grass, not surprisingly by the name, and that's what we've seen in our experiments too. Orchard grass does well in establishing it in a woodlot conversion. That's right. I, thank you, Bruce. I meant to mention that. So this is something that I learned from Greg Judy in Missouri. If you're not familiar uh, with Greg, I encourage you to, he's got some good YouTube videos and he just came and spoke at uh, Savannah Institute's gathering um, last month too. And uh, the way that he establishes woodland uh, civil pasture and has had success is mob stocking his cattle. So actually using bulls for bulldozers and pushing them through at a, a million pounds of hoof per acre but for a very short amount of time for like 20 minutes and keeping them moving and very high density just knocking things down and then um, bringing them back at the next rotation and having bales set out and, because there's not much forage growing there and then using the, the animals as they're eating the bales, and it might be mature or seedy hay, um, and make sure it's seeds that you want, so you don't want to be baling up thistles and bringing them out to your new pasture. But then those animals are going to help disperse that seed, and you might even put that, those bales in strategic places where you want a lot of action to, to, to say, knock down some problematic areas where there's honeysuckle or, or buckthorn or something like that. Um, does that make sense, the way I explained that? That's right. Sometimes he'll actually not just put the bale down, but he'll, he'll roll it out. And you know, people say, oh, but you get so much wastage then. Well, he says, it's not wastage. That's adding organic matter. It's stimulating the biology, um, and it's getting hoof traffic. So he's probably not going to do that with his highest quality hay, but it's a, a way to, you know, instead of going out and buying seed and fertilizer, he's buying a bale and putting, putting it out there. So another way to think about forage establishment in a silvopasture. 
a few photos here of um, some of our experiments. These are, these are big photos. So um, this is a schematic here of what you're looking at. Th this is um, uh, two years in after th where you saw the fecon mower coming through. And this is an area where we didn't broadcast any seed. This is an area where we planted a, a pasture mix with orchard grass and some clover and, and uh, annual and perennial ryegrass and a few others. And, and then you can't see it very well over there, but I think the next photo you do. But actually just having that seed um, made a lot of difference. So the, the animals, when we let them into this paddock, this was a part of a larger paddock that included open pasture. But this was the first place that they came. And you know, these are improved forages, so they're high quality, they're newly planted. So it makes sense that the animals want to come in there. But the competition of having the planted forage, in addition to having uh, more livestock in there, meant there was a lot less undesirable weeds and brush re-sprouting in that area where we planted the grasses. And this is moving over just a little bit at a different time. But this is that area where we planted the grasses. And then the area where we didn't replant the grass, this is mostly prickly ash that's re-sprouted. And the only thing is di that's different is that we planted broadcast seed here and we didn't broadcast it over here. Cattle had equal access to both. So a question here? What so um, it, it was a from Prairie Moon Nursery and it was a diverse mix of, um, of, of um, warm season grasses and cool season grasses and forbs and it was kind of a savanna selected mix too so there's more shade tolerant forbs in there as well. I don't think that the, the experiment was to see, so if you want to establish native uh, prairie restoration or savanna restoration, usually it's a pretty intensive process. If any of you have done it, you know it involves a lot of site prep and a lot of management to be successful. We were going to see if we could take some shortcuts and find a way that farmers who don't want to do all that intensive management can get some, some native plants going in their pastures. We found out that there's a reason why all those intensive steps are part of the process. Just broadcasting the seed was essentially what we did, and it wasn't enough. Um, and so, again, that's part of research as you learn what doesn't work. Yeah, um, let me see if I can th think off the top of my head. Um, yeah, reed canary grass is not a native. <laughs> there is a native canary grass, so maybe that's something to look at. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm blanking a little bit here, but we did, we did have your common, um, you know, the, the big blue stem and little blue stem and Indian grass and switch grass were in there. And those you do see in, in savanna environments as well. But then there, there were more of, of, the, of um, the different forbs as well. We had bush-headed clover in there and, and things like that. I, I recommend if you go to Prairie Moon or other nurseries, sometimes they do have a savanna seed mix. And if you follow up, I can send you some resources that we used to. It's been a while since I looked at our list, so I'm sorry I don't have a better answer for you. A question here? I, I run it. Yeah. If you don't put anything down, I guarantee you, you're right back out there and now you're doing it again. Yep. Yeah, and, and actually the, we did have Canadian and Virginia rye yeah. in there, and that was some of the few natives that actually we did see it come up some. A lot of stuff never did really come up. So um, that's where I think, too, maybe if we had added fire to the protocol, that might have helped stimulate some of that. And but we tried to seed in the fall so that the prairie seed could self-stratify over the winter, and I don't think we got quite the right conditions for that either. So we didn't quite hit the sweet spot for that, but again, we learned a few things that didn't work. Oh, there's, this is the side of it where there was no grazing. And so here you can see even where we planted the agronomic seed, if we didn't have the grazing, then the brush re-sprouted too. So it wasn't just planting the agronomic seed, it was actually having the livestock in there. <coughs> 
And that was in year three. So the first year was a baseline, though. So that was two uh, growing seasons. So we could see the natives come up later, yeah. And so that's something to think about, too. Uh, and here's just one more photo of, of another block where you can, s it's a little bit hard to see, but you can see the green grass here. That's no seed next to agronomic seed. So not as much shrub pressure in this area, but you can see there's just more usable forage where we actually broadcast some seed out there. And, um, and we did do a little bit more site prep there with using the livestock to hoof in those seeds after we broadcast. Um, this is just something to think about. Sometimes we just think we got to get grass growing, um, but different livestock have different preferences in terms of how much uh, grass do they eat, how many forbs do they eat, and how much browse do they eat. And it's not just different species, but different breeds within those species. So for example, this was a study with Highland cattle where they followed them and saw how much time they spent eating different things. And they only spent 29% of their time eating grass. A third of the time they were eating forbs, and a third of the time they were eating trees and shrubs. So it's not like we need to knock all of the brush out of there. There's usable forage there too, and so looking forward to talking more about that tomorrow as well. This was just with Highland cattle, which are known to be more brush eaters. For yeah, I, I think that that kind of data is out there but I don't, I don't have it here. But pigs are not going to generally eat as much grass, but that does vary by breed as well. I'm not sure what this slide is. Um, so this is just an emphasis that, again, silvopasture means intensive animal management. Just putting livestock out into the woods is not silvopasture. So having, if you're not doing rotational grazing already, Get, get that system going first before you try to go to civil pasture um, because it's not, it's not going to work if you're not prepared to, mo to move your cattle or your other livestock on a regular basis. And um, this is a shot from one of our research plots here where, you know, sometimes you hear about flash grazing or mob grazing. I think that that's a, that's a good principle generally is that um, most civil pasture paddocks are going to need a shorter interval of access and they're going to need to be moved on pretty quickly um, because a lot of times the the soil and the forage layer is it's more sensitive we might say or more brittle is the language that sometimes is used for that and so that threshold to where you've gone too far I think is going to come more quickly um, than in, in a lot of open pastures where you have a healthy sward with a pretty established sod. Oops. Um, I want to highlight a, a few more things. Again, we're, we're going a mile wide and an inch deep here. Uh, some field days I mentioned, hopefully the Kearney Farm this year. We have other uh, field days Savannah Institute is working on that will include some silvopastures pastures as well. I mentioned Greg Judy. We've got um, on our website a virtual tour. It's, it's more like a 10 minute interview that shows some of the different things he's doing on his farm, including silvopasture. pasture. We've got a series of um, called nutshell webinar style recordings. Um, those, are, those are ongoing, including coming up in a month or two, we've got Tom Wall, who many of you know, talking about pawpaws. And those are all uh, recorded that you can watch later on um, on our website as well. And, and some of those deal with civil pasture and related enterprises as well. And then coming out in the next few months, most likely, we've got a series of podcasts where uh, beginning farmers interviewed experienced people, people who've done silvo pasture. And so trying to share that knowledge exchange, those conversations with anybody who's interested by having those interviews available as recordings. We have a website uh, we spearheaded called perennialmap.org, which is still in development. Um, but if you're not sure who's around you, that's also you know, raising sheep or pigs that might be appropriate for pasture or silvo pasture systems, it's a good way to find other people who are doing that. I think um, the Facebook silvo pasture group is growing every day. There's a, a few thousand people on there now. Good things get exchanged there. And then, you know, PFI, of course, this kind of community, there's nothing better than this, hearing from somebody 
in your neighborhood or in your region who's been doing something and learning from there. Hopefully so you don't have to repeat their mistakes, but you can repeat their successes. Um, again, I won't go through all of these, but this is some further reading. These slides are going to be on the PFI website. Uh, this is an article in the Moses Organic Broadcaster I wrote a couple years ago that has some more on silvopasture establishment too. Here's the perennial map I mentioned. It's a series of dots. Most of them are farms, but also farm businesses and organizations. And if you click on one, a little bar pops out that gives you more information about that farm. You, you might even be on there. We got publicly available directories off the internet and, and just aggregated them. And so if you don't want to be on there, you can go on there and erase yourself. Or if you want the information to be updated, you can update it as well. I mentioned this book, um, also available for free as a PDF. A lot more information on, on planting trees, of course, that's the topic there. But also planning out how it can work uh, and selecting species and that sort of thing. Um, this is a photograph from my home country in the Driftless area. Uh, this is the Black River watershed, but uh, in the 1930s, there was a lot of land that looked like this. And I think it's important to point out that this was largely caused by farming without tractors or chemicals or any of the things that we usually point to. This is just poor management and overdoing it. And so I think with silvopasture, it's important to keep this historical note in mind that um, th we are I think rightly interested in the capacity of well-managed livestock to regenerate ecosystems, farming communities, and, and that sort of thing. But there's also the capacity to do a lot of damage that's lasting. And I like this quote from Aldo Leopold, our tools are better than we are and grow faster than we do. They suffice to crack the atom to command the tides, but they do not suffice for the oldest task in human history to live on a piece of land without spoiling it. And, and so I, I think that's the potential of civil pasture is to further develop this oldest task in human history. How do we to maintain the productivity and health and vitality of the landscapes that we steward? Um, and another Leopold quote to end on here, the landscape of a farm is the owner's portrait of himself. I think he meant to be inclusive, but that was written in the 40s too. Um, but uh, I encourage you to, to um, share your questions and experiences with each other. I'm also still very much learning about this. I think we're, we all are together, so that's why it's exciting to be here. And I um, want to thank everyone, who, the farmers that I worked with and the research that I presented here especially, and to you for your attention. we got a little bit of time for some discussion here too. Yeah, sure. Any comments or yeah, comments or questions? Um, I wanted to leave a little bit of time for discussion. I do have about 20 more slides of data too, if we need to kill time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good way to be thinking is how can we get the livestock to do as much of the work as possible for us? And that's, I think, really context dependent on what livestock do you have or what neighbors do you have. Um, Bruce was describing he has a neighbor with goats, and so he's been able to work out an arrangement where uh, a pasture that he's improving, uh, his neighbor's goats are doing some of that work for him. And goats can be really helpful in a situation where you've got a lot of brush because that's what goats like to eat. Um, if you're planting trees, goats can be a lot more challenging. So it might not be the right, uh, but in a case where you're planting trees, there are uh, breeds of sheep that are more apt to keep their head down. And I'm blanking on what was the breed I learned about that does this, but they're essentially orchard sheep. and um, and so they have a tendency to want to graze rather than browse. And I think that's something I don't have as much knowledge on as I'd like to, but this kind of group can share what they know uh, in terms of livestock breeds. 
within sheep, within pigs, within cattle, there are different preferences for, for grazing and browsing that can be leveraged. Yeah? I don't know much about llamas, so I won't pretend. Llama, llama, going once. Will they, will they eat multiflora rows? Does anybody know llamas? <laughs> A good guard animal, llamas. Yeah. Any other thought, thoughts, questions? The question is, what did the farmers who were planting trees use for shade uh, while they were waiting for the trees to get tall? Um, in some cases, the, the animals didn't have shade, which is, uh, can be problematic, but not necessarily either, depending on the context. Um, in other cases, there were, they also had woodlands that they were able to use. Uh, another farm had some structures and not, none of the farms that I worked with did this, but um, there are these portable shade structures as well that you can buy. They're pretty expensive, the Shade Haven, or you can, you can build them as well if you're handy enough to do that. Um, but an another thing that some of the farms did was they intentionally planted, um, interplanted very uh, fast growing trees with the intention that they would thin those out when they started to shade out the other trees. So planting hybrid poplar you know, every other or every three, four trees, or doing a, a row of hybrid poplar uh, where they could get some shade. You know, with, within uh, three, four years, those trees can be tall enough that they're providing a, a strip of usable shade. <coughs> Bless you. Does that answer your question? Any other thoughts on getting shade when you don't have it? Other, Bruce? What, what about gophers? Does anybody know how to raise gophers? I, I got a really good crop going. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't have any good answers on gophers, you know. Huh. Do you remember what that's called? That Okay, so it's a noise deterrent. It's solar powered. Solar powered that you stick in the ground. Okay. Any other thoughts, questions?
Yeah. So the, the question about is you're planning out silvo pasture, and I think any grazing system, are there places where you don't want your animals to be? Um, I think the short answer is yes. The longer answer is that oftentimes it's not as much about yes or no are there animals, but how are the animals managed and given access to it. So for example, you mentioned creek banks. Um, there in, in Wisconsin, there's been a lot of, of research and experience, I'm not sure about Iowa, on using livestock to help manage those riparian areas, which is a fancy word for creek banks. And the, the main takeaway is that if used judiciously, uh, livestock can help keep down woody vegetation that oftentimes leads to undercutting of banks. And keeping, that, keeping an herbaceous vegetation on that creek bank is oftentimes desirable. Now, if the wear gets too intense, of course, hoof traffic can cause erosion on those banks as well. Um, and oftentimes the solution is as simple as running a single poly wire, even if it's not electrified, if the animals are trained to it, to give that area more rest so that it can revegetate when it's starting to erode. Um, so that's one example. We mentioned really healthy forests. You know, if you've got rare, high quality, uh, wildflowers, you don't have a lot of invasives, you've got good quality timber, um, really that forest is probably best without livestock or, or it's a very limited scope where you're going to want livestock in there. Uh, really wet ground can be, uh, for a variety of reasons, a challenge for livestock. Sometimes that's the ground on a farm that gets designated for livestock too though, so, so that depends. Um, you know, there's a lot of experience in this room too on where you don't want livestock to have access to, but there's a few thoughts. Any other thoughts on that question? Yeah. Choke cherries for stream banks, an NRCS recommendation. You know, it, it really depends on the, the stream some streams are going to, with an herbaceous or a grassy bank, are going to do better. Others, having a, sh a shrubby or even a wooded bank, are going to are going to do better. It depends on the size of the stream and the way it flows, et cetera. It's not my area of expertise, but I think choke cherry or other shrubs can work in some cases on a stream bank. Um, w this is sort of a random note, but just reminded by bringing up cherry. Um, and we'll get into this tomorrow, maybe you're planning on mentioning it, Steve, but one thing with livestock in the woods to note is that you'll oftentimes hear people with horror stories about toxic plants, um, and it's worth being aware of, but like Steve mentioned, and I think we'll talk about more tomorrow, oftentimes that's not the animals not knowing what they're getting into, not having seen it before, or not having adequate resources of good feed, and that's why they eat something that's not good for them. But one thing to be aware of is if you have a black cherry tree, a wild cherry, come down. When, that, when those leaves are wilty and they're not completely dead but they're not very alive, they do have a, a higher level of cyanide. And so even though they're safe to eat off a healthy tree, so livestock might be used to eating them, you do want to keep an eye out for uh, black cherry that's come down and not letting them eat the wilted leaves. So something to take home. Um, any, any other questions or discussion points before we wrap this part of the presentation up? Let's thank Steve. Steve. Nice